My name is Lynn Fichter. I am in the Geology and Environmental Science Department at James Madison University. My training is as a vertebrate paleontologist. did both my master's and PhD at the University of Michigan. But I'm one of those people who is just sort of endlessly curious about lots and lots of things. And when I came to JMU, and I've lost track, I think this is my 37th year at JMU. When I came to JMU, um, I started asking some of the professors that were there about the local geology, because I wanted to learn it, because I had never been here. And they took me around to see some of the rocks that they knew, and some of the history that is located here. And I kept asking questions for which they couldn't give me answers, which for which I discovered after a while there weren't any answers. And the questions were about this geology, this state, where this place came from, how it got to be the way it is today. And so I have spent the next couple of decades trying to unravel this history that is found in this state, this marvelous, marvelous geologic history. I mean, I've said that this is some of the most uh, interesting geology there is anywhere in the world, and I think that's absolutely true. We can take students in a two-hour drive to see virtually any kind of geology that you could find virtually anywhere in the world. We've all got it here, and it's a nice little microcosm of it. So when this project came up and Martha came to my office asking me for um, some information that she could use to work with, I jumped on this um, very, very quickly. Um, so that's the reason um, that I'm, I'm here. Um, I'm a, a, a teacher by, by nature. Um, I love getting up in front of the classroom and, and talking. Um, but I'm going to try to keep myself relatively brief um, today. If I get going, I'm going to, I'll get out of hand. Um, but I, I learned a, an embarrassing thing about myself this morning um, when I was putting together uh, what I wanted to say. I, I came to discover how I have come to rely on PowerPoint. <laughs> God help us. <clears throat> I use PowerPoint to put up slides to spark me to say, oh, this is the next thing you're going to talk about. And once I have that started, then I can take off. Um, so I'm, I'm reduced to the embarrassment of having to have some notes in front of me. Uh, and I'm going to refer to them occasionally. Um, but um, let's see if I can say something here that, that might um, be of interest to you. To begin with, it might not seem that geologists and politicians would have much in common. And in fact, we probably don't, except maybe for one thing. And it's a saying that I hear about politics occasionally that goes like this. All politics is local. Well, in geology, we have a similar saying, and it's that all geology is local. It is infinitely variable. And learning the geology in one place does not make you a good geologist, because the next phrase that comes after all geology is local is this one. But you're only as good a geologist as the amount of geology you have seen. Which means, as a geologist, we need to travel and travel and travel and travel. And everywhere we go, we learn more things about the Earth. There isn't a field trip I go on where I don't find something or a student brings me something and says, what is this? And I go, I haven't a clue what that is. I'm always amazed that the Earth is able to produce all this variety. So that's a connection with politicians. But you know, sometimes listening to a geologist talk is like 
listening to an economist talk. It all sort of sounds like English, if I just knew what all those words meant. We do have a large and arcane vocabulary that we use. And in fact, I don't know if this is true, but it, it ought to be true. Uh, I've been told that somebody taking an introductory course in geology has to learn more new vocabulary words than somebody taking an introductory course in a foreign language. And that's probably the case. The terms go on and on and on and on and on. So one of the challenges of this project was to take something which is very, very, very complicated and put it down in some kind of a form that the average person could look at and get something out of. And I don't know if we have succeeded on that. Um, I'm hoping we have. But one of the things we've tried to do is put multiple levels into these posters where somebody comes along and um, they only spend five seconds on it and they read the work of a field geologist to read great events in the rocks of the Earth's crust. If that's the only thing they walk away with, I'd be happy because that is in fact what we do. I don't know if you've lived out west at all, but there is an enormous contrast between people who live in the west and people who live in the east. And it boils down to, in the east, everything has got a plant growing on it. Sorry, Chip. Out west, there are very few plants by perspective, and rocks are out there, and they're exposed, and they're easy to see. And even if you aren't interested, you can't avoid them. But here, you can drive for hours across this state and never see a rock, never see an outcrop, and never be aware of what is right below your feet. That's what I want to do here, is I want people to begin to understand. Because another saying we have in geology is this, the work of a field geologist is to read great events in the rocks that compose the Earth's crust. And these are great events. The world as we experience it right now here is unlike it has ever been in the past. And you can't begin to appreciate or understand what this geology is like if you stay only embedded in what is right in front of us. For as beautiful as this country is, and as much as I love this country, it is a very narrow view. For example, a billion years ago, this spot right here was a white, hot, seething magma chamber about 10 miles below ground. 700 million years ago, this area was undergoing a rifting event. Heat was coming up from below, lifting the earth up, cracking it, causing large blocks to collapse down into the center. It's like the East African <coughs> rift today. And it was here. The difference is the East African rift is mostly tropical. When this area was undergoing rifting, the Earth was undergoing something called snowball Earth. Snowball Earth are four great glaciations, lasted about 10 million years apiece. They took the average temperature of the Earth down to minus 51. It was cold enough that the oceans froze at the equator. 200 million years after that, this area was a broad, tropical, tidal flat, like the Bahama Banks are today. And a couple of hundred million years after that, there were rivers flowing out of a mountain range to the east, laying down deposits across here and dumping their sediments in the sea to the west. 
because the sea was there. The geography was completely reversed. We read great events in the rocks that compose the Earth's crust. Now, the average person going along Rockfish River, where Chip went this morning and collected these, is going to see dirty old stones. Maybe different kinds of dirty old stones, but they're dirty old stones. To see deeper into these, to see what is in these rocks, you've got to have with you the symbol of the geologist, and that's a rock hammer. You know, we don't carry the rock hammers around because we think it looks cool. <laughs> in order to see these rocks for what they really are, you have to get away from the weathered surface on the outside. You have to break them over, open and get into the pristine interior. So we go around and we bust the rocks. And when you see a geologist, most of the time you're going to see dangling around their neck a little hand lens. And after they busted that rock open, they pick up that hand lens and they're down there looking at the individual grains that make up the rock. And in that, they are able to read the history. It makes me think a little bit of William Blake's Auguries to Innocence, to hold the world, to see the world in a grain of sand to see heaven in a flower, to hold eternity in the palm of your hand, and infinity, you know, infinity in the palm of your hand, and eternity in an hour. Because as we look at these rocks, they are not recording necessarily just one event. There is event within event within event within event. And so the process of analyzing and understanding what the past is, is to know, for example, that this rock, which comes from underneath Elk Hill, is some of the granite that was formed down in that deep baffling. And then about 100 million years later, it underwent high heat and pressure to metamorphose it to produce a rock that looks like this. And then, Later, it underwent compression and shearing and grinding to turn that rock into this. So when a geologist picks up this rock and breaks it open with their hammer and gets out their hand lens and looks inside there, they are looking for that whole series of events that take you back to the time when the rock first formed. It's our business. It's what we do. And it has revealed this great history which lies in this part of the world. It has taken hundreds of geologists, about 150 years to get to where we are now, understanding it, where we are now. And we aren't anywhere near done. Geologists in universities all over the state continue to discover new things, continue to find new things about the earth, continue to reinterpret what this area is like. So when I look back over this work that I've done, it's easy for me to appreciate why I love it so much why I am so absolutely fascinated by it, that I can't let it go, that I come back to it over and over and over again. And my hope is that this Rockfish Valley Geology Trail is going to help people learn to appreciate and love this area in ways that they have never known how to appreciate and love it.